Hi everyone, welcome back to Useful Genetics. This is Lecture 9M. We're going to extend our discussion of hybridization and species into conservation issues. I'm going to describe three examples. First is hybrid spruce in Western Canada and how they are spreading because of climate change. The second is giraffes, both what are the species boundaries and who should be allowed to breed. And the third is the preservation of the red wolf species, which might not be a species at all. Hybridization and the identity of species and species boundaries are critical concerns for conservation programs. And we're discovering that we need to use DNA testing to carefully clarify the boundaries of species and the extent of hybridization, which turns out to be much more common than we would have originally thought. We can't rely on phenotypes to tell us who's related to who anymore. We have to use DNA testing because it's turning out that many individuals that we thought were the same species are actually probably different species. This raises issues about how do we preserve wild populations? Should we promote interbreeding between very small populations, even if they're not perhaps very closely related? Should we preserve endangered species that are actually hybrid, hybrid swarms, hybrid collections of different hybrids? Um, what should we do with captive breeding programs? Who should be allowed to breed and who should they be allowed to breed with? So the first example I'm going to discuss is um, spruce trees in Western Canada. This is work from the lab of Dr. Sally Aiken, who's one of the geneticists who you could meet in the five geneticists taking a break on Saturna Island video that I think you'll find maybe somewhere in the, the uh, genetics in the news folder. Um, her research is investigating, among other things, the role of hybridization between two species of spruce trees. The Engelmann spruce, which um, is shown in blue, and the white spruce shown in green. And these species have undergone substantial hybridization. All of these colored dots here indicate places where hybrid individuals have been found with different mixtures of genes. These two spaces are the two different study populations. Below them are the proportions of hybrid plants and uh, hybrid trees and the two parent species that they predict will be seen in 2050. Because the climate is warming, they predict that the range of the blue species, which is the more northern one, is going to contract moving farther north. And the green species, and particularly the hybrid individuals will be moving into space previously occupied by the Engelmann spruce. Now the second subject that I want to bring up is giraffes. Giraffes are a very charismatic species. Um, we love to see them in zoos and zookeepers have been breeding giraffes in captivity for a long time because giraffes are quite happy to breed in captivity. But zookeepers traditionally have regarded all giraffes as basically the same species. And it's not until DNA testing was done that they began to see that, wait, maybe these different populations of giraffes are actually different, at least different subspecies, if not different species. And the results of that analysis are shown here. We have here the um, reticulated giraffe, the sort of canonical species that we think of when we see giraffes. And its closest relative, and closely living near it, turns out to be the Maasai giraffe, which has quite a different coat pattern and color. Both of these, it turns out, are actually very distantly related to two other populations of giraffes. One, the different looking but very close neighbors, Rothschild's giraffe, and the other, this very similar looking but very distant population of the West African giraffe. So now zookeepers are having to both 
think to the future about which new animals should they include in their breeding programs, and think to the past, which of the animals already in their breeding programs are relatively pure examples of genes from these distinct populations, some of which are so distinct they are almost certainly deserving of being considered different species. They've not been significantly interbreeding for probably millions of years. Now, this sort of erupted to a head in um, the winter of 2014 when the Copenhagen Zoo announced that it was going to call one of its young giraffes, a young male named Marius. And they were going to call him because his genes were too similar to the genes of other graphs, giraffes already in breeding programs at their zoo or at other zoos. And so they announced that instead of allowing him to breed or even keeping him on, having him use up valuable breeding program space, they were instead going to kill him. And then they were going to do a public autopsy. This is a picture of small children in Copenhagen watching the autopsy of this giraffe. And then they were going to cut him up and feed him to other carnivores because that's what the other carnivores would typically eat in their natural environment. And there was a terrible outcry mostly sort of somewhat sentimentally based. Couldn't you save him? Couldn't you find him somewhere else to live? But the zookeeper was quite staunch in his genetic principles that both, both that doing the public autopsy, which is a standard policy of the Copenhagen Zoo, was giving children a chance to get an understanding of anatomy that they would never otherwise get. And that the putting down of this one giraffe was recommended by the group that oversees the breeding programs of all of the European zoos that participate in a joint giraffe breeding program because there were already a lot of giraffes with similar genes in the breeding program. Now the third example is that of the red wolf. Red wolves were very common in the southeastern U.S. like um, Texas, New Mexico, areas like that, when Europeans first came. But Europeans quickly killed them off because they competed with European livestock. However, luckily, the red wolf was being maintained in captivity in zoos, and they were bred and reintroduced into the wild. This was a big ecological success story. A species had been saved except that recent genetic research suggests, well, maybe what was saved wasn't a species at all. This was a study on um, the genomes of wolves, coyotes, the red wolf, and dogs, and it used a SNP typing array that had been developed for domestic dogs. This is an array like the arrays that companies like 23andMe used for humans. This one had been developed specifically for dogs and was used mainly by dog enthusiasts who wanted to know what breed their mongrel puppy belonged to. But it turns out that the same SNPs are common in wolves and coyotes as well as in dogs. And so the researchers were able to identify large number of SNPs that were characteristic of coyote chromosomes. This is the coyote SNP alleles uh, shown on the dog chromosomes, which are very similar to the coyote chromosomes, the wolf, the wolf chromosomes, and also Western coyote chromosomes. They found coyote-specific alleles that were consistent in all the coyote samples. But when they looked at the red wolf, it's a mishmash of segments from coyotes, segments from western wolves, and many segments that contain mixtures of wolf and coyote genes. And you'll remember from our, our discussion of how haplotypes decay with crossing over over the generations, that a pattern that, like this must reflect not just a couple of generations of hybridization, but many generations of both interbreeding between hybrids that had initially formed between coyotes and wolves, and subsequent breeding back to the wolves, and especially the coyotes, as indicated by these relatively long red segments. So the genetics clearly says that the red wolf 
is not an endangered species. It's not that it's not endangered. It's not a species. Should we save it anyway? Well, legally, there's no question. Under the U.S. Endangered Species Act, the red wolf is a distinct endangered species, and large sums of money are being paid to protect it. So we've considered three different examples. Um, considering the role of hybrids in planning for climate change in our forests, um, about hybridization between what probably are distinct species in breeding programs, and about a species that's been doing its own hybridization and is probably not really a distinct species at all. Coming up next, our last two lectures are going to talk about breeding in plants. First about conventional plant breeding in Lecture 9N, and then about breeding genetically modified organisms in Lecture 9O. I hope to see you there.